Hello and welcome to the British Sitcom History Podcast. You are listening to part two of our look at Rising Damp. So if you haven't listened to last week's episode, please do go back and check that out first. We've already looked at the careers of Leonard Rossiter and Francis de la Tour. We've talked about Eric Chappell's play The Banana Box, from which this sitcom came. So you've already missed all that. Go back and check it out if you haven't already. On with the show. Okay, so let's go back to our episode. Oh, so yes. we, we've opened up, we've got Rigsby talking to Miss Jones, mm-hmm. and he asks her on a date to the wrestling, which I think is, yes. is a very 1974 reference. Well, obviously, they, they have a guy who lives there. In that first series, mm. there's another guy who lives there who's a wrestler, and he, he appears in a couple of episodes. Right, okay. So they kind of mentioned it previously. And so you talked about these different scenes. So that's the first scene. What's the second scene in this episode? We go uh, to upstairs mm-hmm. to the attic room where Alan and Phil are uh, talking about women. Now, Alan and Phil, obviously, in the first episode, we introduce them like they they have to live together now, get on with it. Yeah. But very quickly, they become friends yeah. and confidants. So we see that and we see that energy right here. If you'd never seen the show before, you go, oh, these two young lads, they're friends. They share this hat, they, you know, they share this room. But it's interesting you say these two young lads are friends and they are close, but I think it's, I think Philip's like a big brother. You know, it's it's almost yeah. a paternal relationship. Philip's kind of looking after his, yeah. his younger, well, yeah, like his younger brother. Yeah, I think Alan is, Alan is the naive, yes. you know, he's the, the kind of young, yeah, innocent lad, whereas Phil is much more worldly. Mm-hmm. And so... Um, they're talking about girls they're dating, and they, you know Philip wants to bring his girlfriend back, but Rigsby won't let him. And this, they, but they set up the plot, which is, hey, look, if we get him and Miss Jones together, they'll go out tonight, and then we can have our girls back. Nice. We just set that up, you know, a couple minutes scene, and then Rigsby enters. Well, you forgot the detail about Alan's got himself an earring. Oh yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> which and then so I mean, well, I mean, Rigsby comes in immediately starts attacking Alan for being effeminate, which is like the go-to thing. Like, that's what he does with Alan and with he's got long Philip. Hair. It's like, yeah, exactly, and an earring. Oh, my God. <laughs> Stop the world. I want to get off. <laughs> oh, my God, what's that? What? There, on your ear, quick, something glinting. What is it? It's an earring. And it... Oh. Stop the world. I want to get off. What's wrong with it? He looks like the gypsy's morning. But everybody's wearing them these days, Rigsby. God help England, that's all I can say. Let's hope the Russians don't find out. I can just see us all marching into battle in bloody earrings. That'll really send us through the face with the enemy. Philip thinks it's all right. Oh, he would. He thinks a bone through the nose is all right. But that's that's what these these guys are. It's this generational gap. He doesn't understand the young people and what they're all up to. The permissive society. They're, they're all just trying to have sex. Whereas that's exactly what he's trying to do as well. He's yeah. just he's, yeah. He just won't admit it to himself. Yeah. He so yeah he he makes fun of Alan for being effeminate. He'll make fun of Phil for being uh, primitive. Usually, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Here's, here's the line. He's, oh, it's all right for you lot in Africa. You're closer to nature. I haven't been close to nature since last Christmas, and it wasn't very close then. (laughs) There is a nice run of euphemism in Eric Chappell's writing. He he, he makes quite a subtle euphemism. In fact, I wrote wrote down, um, I went through this whole thing. I made note as of every joke, um, (laughs) as in every big laugh. So not including little titters or a bit of a rolling laugh, just the kind of big punchline laugh. And... (laughs) Over the course of this 24 minutes, yeah. I've got 101 wow. laughs. That's amazing. And I broke it down a little bit. Miss Jones has three laughs. <laughs> now, that's interesting. Obviously, Rigsby has the most laughs. But Miss Jones laughs. One of them is a physical comedy thing where she pulls the doorknob off uh-huh. after he's fixed it. That's a bit of a physical gag. The other two laughs that Miss Jones gets, her first line is, could you look at my doorknob? And it gets a laugh. And I was like, that's not an innuendo, is it? (laughs) Does that make sense as an innuendo? And then the other big laugh she gets where she says, Mr. Rigsby, extinguish your stick. (laughs) And that's not, that's not really an innuendo either, is it? (laughs) But it gets a laugh. I think (laughs) we've talked about this before, about my incredulity at how ecstatic a studio audience are to be there. I I, I can't remember which episode it was specifically. We talked in previous episodes about the audience going absolutely nuts for lines that aren't that funny. Yeah. There's a little bit of hype involved and, you know, you're in the room and other people are in the the moment. Yeah. And obviously it helps to the production. But yeah, 
those lines aren't objectively funny. <laughs> but I think you've got to give something to delivery there. Yes. You know, the way that Delator delivers that in this kind of, just the way you speak it will kind of present it as a slight innuendo. If you actually think about it, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. But that's nice. And it's also, yeah, like it's within the context of the scene yeah. in which there's a, there's all this repartee anyway. But yeah, I'll, I'll come back to my kind of joke list a little bit as we go along because right. there's some little moments like... We're talking about Alan and his earring and his long hair and Rigsby's mm-hmm. constantly denigrating him. So let's talk more about the Alan character now. Uh, I mean, he's the youngster. Like you say, he's he's supposed to be a medical student. He's supposed to be early 20s. Talks a big game or, or, or wants to talk a big game with women, but is actually mm. pretty useless with them. And that is kind of highlighted when with Phil, because Phil's very good with the ladies. Yeah. But I think his Alan's front, Alan's uh, bravado is paper thin. You know, he'll he'll sort mm. of he'll sort of have the you know I'll, I'll bring a girl back, and Philip will say, "Well, you you you've never brought a girl back," and he just crumbles straight away. <laughs> oh god! <laughs> uh, he says, what, yeah. "What about that girl that keeps following me? What girl? The one on the racing bike? Oh, you can't count her. She never dismounts." <laughs> And of course, we get a call back to that later when he brings a girl back up to the room. We'll come back to that when we get to that scene. Let's go on to the next scene. Well, no, well, what we set up in that scene is the plan. They help Rigsby. Mm. They give him a Matt Monroe album, and uh, Alan gives him these tranquilizer pills that he's got. Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? Like, that was a thing in the 70s. Here you go. Take a couple of these downers. <laughs> like, yeah, that was perfectly normal to take a couple of pills. Uh, where do you get those? Were they prescribed on the NHS? <laughs> 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 what for? I, I don't... I'm not, I don't know where they came from. I think the idea is he's a medical student, so you can kind of just get... Well, so he can like steal this. stuff from the pharmacy? I don't think so. <laughs> well, he says he got them from a friend. <laughs> But yeah, we, we sort of set up the mechanics of what's to come here. And that is the next scene, which is Rigsby attempting to seduce Miss Jones. Mm. But this time he is drugged up to the eyeballs because he's taken all these pills. Yes. This is uh, probably the main bit of physical comedy in the in the episode. Well, yeah, this is my least favourite scene. And, and I think, uh, you know, generally I'm not a fan of physical comedy. It's not really what floats my boat. Right, yeah. Um, and yeah, it just, seems, it just seems silly and farcical, you know. So he, he's playing the record at the wrong speed, first of all, which, which you know. Is, is hilarious. She's saying, oh, Mr. Rigsby, the record. And he can't tell because he's ripped off his tits. <laughs> yes. There's quite a lot of nice little gags, though. Like, where he goes, where's the handle for the, the gramophone? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, he's so old. Well, it's not because he's so old. It's because his record player's so old. Because why would he buy a new yes. one? There's nothing wrong with this one. <laughs> yeah. And he's doing the faces and, and, like, staggering all over the place. He's getting a lot of laughs. There's a bit in the first scene with Miss Jones in which he sits next to her. Mm. And he just sort of nudges her over a little bit as he sits next to her, and and kind of gives her like, oh, what's your time? kind of that, that little sort of apologetic noise he makes, yeah. and he gets a laugh for that. And it's that's that's Leonard Rosser, like that, that is classic Leonard Rosser, that little physical movement, yeah. the little noise and all yeah, that. Yeah, that is good business. And then we we get a kind of callback to that where he again sits next to her on the settee, but he's so drugged up he just sort of drops onto the settee <laughs> and, and shuffles her over. So I thought that was a nice little moment in the whole thing. You're, you're right. I think the show as a whole has an easy tendency to go to farce. There's quite mm. a lot of that, actually. A lot of the plots are built around that. And I think it does it well. And and, and just talk about the show in general. It's very dialogue-driven and there's very character-driven stuff. But they will have these sitcom plots, you mm. know? And I, I th- And I think that's what I like least. I'm not... It's just my personal taste. I don't. I, I like the snappy yeah. dialogue more than the farcical situation. Yes, I think I do think this show handles it well uh, when they do that. You know, it is just like oh, the vicar's coming round and the cat's knocked over the best china yes. or, or whatever. But it is they do it well, and it's just because it's well written and the characters and actors are obviously good. So I think it gets away with a lot more than but I think we were. You know, we talked before about that pink carnation episode with the lonely hearts, the blind date, yeah. and then we watched another episode, clunk click. Where where Rigsby has a car and he's had a bump with someone else and this guy's coming mm-hmm. round and the bit that I don't like about it which is what I don't like about farce is that you can see from the moment of the setup it's just like oh god and then we're gonna you know we can see what's gonna happen he's gonna come round and it's gonna be embarrassment and I just don't like that it just all seems too formulaic to me yeah I know what you mean I know what you mean but it's a lot easier to write that stuff than yeah and, and, and obviously Eric Chappell's writing however many episodes a year so I, I, far be it from me to criticise the man I've never written anything actually just speaking of Eric Chappell uh, if I may give you a little bit more information about him right now yeah. just 
you made me think of something there. He uh, so this was his first show, but he was writing other stuff, and he got another show commissioned at pretty much the same time called The Squirrels. The Squirrels. I don't suppose you've ever heard of The Squirrels. No, it hasn't really gone down in history in the same way. Uh, no, and uh, he, I, I watched a few episodes of it, just sort of get a taste of it. Like that, he the stuff in the first series that was going out at the same time as Rising Damp. It's not as good. It's a. It feels a lot more sitcommy and yeah, farcical. Mm. But the acting is just not to the same standard. It, it, the whole thing feels sloppier. You know, the filming and and the acting and the acting's not bad by any means, and the writing still feels good. But yeah, he got these two series commissioned at the same time, and all of a sudden he was like, right, we need like twelve episodes. <laughs> right. And so he burned himself out a little bit, and he sort of stuck with Rising Damp, and then they got in other writers for the Squirrels to to do extra episodes for that, okay. which he didn't like. He thought they were crap <laughs> the other writers <laughs> so uh, i haven't watched all the episodes yet so i can't really judge but it was interesting to watch that as a as a side piece because it's like it's yeah the the word is looser i think it's just it feels much more like a slack 70s knock it out sitcom yeah whereas rising damp feels so tight mm. and i think that's leonard rossiter frankly that's he's the one who was yeah, making that happen so. well look, while we're on the subject of eric chapel we talked about his background tell me about what he did after this he did only when i laugh Oh, right, okay. He did Duty Free. Oh, Duty Free. Hapless holidaymaker Keith Barron. <laughs> yes. Home to Roost he did. Home to Roost. That was John Thor, wasn't it? Yes. Yes, I remember. Yes. So that was quite a big show at John his time. John Thor Reese Dinsdale? That's right, I yes. I remember that, yes. Yeah. A couple other things. Uh, he did Fiddler's 3, which is a remake of The Squirrels. And, you know, he he writes a lot of plays as well. Uh, apparently, they're very popular with, like, you know, um, amateur dramatics and stuff. Okay. Simple comedy scripts. Yeah. Four characters characters you know all in one setting you know your classic uh, yeah rep scripts yeah very sitcommy and he seems to have made a, a pretty healthy living off of the back of that yeah he's certainly assured his legacy you know rising damp was not a fluke because he, he went off and wrote only when i laugh did extremely well and duty free was you know of its time yeah. <laughs> and you know rising damp might be the one that he's remembered for but to say he wasn't just a churn him out writer like like he didn't come through the mm. sketch writing here's a brief knock something out for us kind of thing it would be much more possible that he had this kind of very one big thing that was a bit more personal to him and then and like he wrote everything he knew into it or, or whatever he, he always wrote the play and then sort of turned it into a sitcom that seemed to be the way he liked to do it right so duty free is based on a play oh, okay. uh, as well yeah that's interesting so uh but yeah he's he, he seems to have done all right out of it he seems pretty happy with his success I've heard interviews with him. So we're still at the scene with the, the, the drugged Rigby, Rigsby. Yes. That scene kind of ends in farce and a big laugh and fade to black. So what happens next? Well, that's pretty much our halfway point in the show. Mm. And then the second half of the show is kind of the same again. We saw, we re-establish it. The Matt Munro and, and like chatter up kind of thing was Alan's technique. Yeah. So now he's going to use Philip's technique, Lovewood, which Philip about. assures him is this Lovewood stuff. Yeah, but we also have it that in that scene where he comes and admonishes Alan for drugging him, yeah. giving him the thing. It's not a little bit of writing I wanted to pop out because the the scene starts with Philip and Alan and Philip says, oh, he's, he's coming after you and he, he says he can't feel his teeth. Mm-hmm. And then Rigsby comes in and it's 20 seconds later, he says, I still can't feel my teeth as a punchline and gets a huge laugh. Yeah. After we've just had the exact same joke 20 seconds earlier, <laughs> which got a laugh. That must be deliberate, surely. I don't know, because it was... It it's was odd repetition, isn't it? It was an odd one. And the turns your water green and my water's turned green. And then the the girl he's meeting later says, oh, my sister had them. It turned her water's green. Gets a laugh every time. <laughs> it's, it's exactly the same joke every time. It gets a laugh. But that's that's an interesting, you know, you could talk about something wrong with your pee in a different way and it'd still be funny, it'd still be a callback to what had yeah. been said earlier. But to use the same words, it must be deliberate. It's got to be the way he wanted to do it. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Yes, yeah, so um, Rigsby comes in, he sort of tells off Alan, Alan runs away, and then he has this discussion with Phil, as we've, we've, we've sorted out. And then we have the next scene in which Alan has got a lady friend mm. over to his place. 
So yeah, we kind of set this up earlier in, in the sense that he's saying, "Oh, I've got, I've, I have got a girlfriend." No, you don't believe me? I've got a girlfriend. So he gets this girl up to his room. Now this is just a one-off guest, Liz Edmiston, uh, who's playing Maureen. But here's the interesting thing, right? When I was doing my joke tally, she's in this one scene really, and she gets eleven laughs. She has a lot of punchlines. That's more than Philip and Miss Jones have combined <laughs> in the whole episode. Yeah. So she is the comedy character in this scene, and even when Riggs becomes in, she still gets a few laughs, which is rare. Rigsby, out of the 101 laughs, Rigsby got 68. Right. Uh, that's obviously his job. Like I said, Miss Jones doesn't get any. Alan has 13, Philip has six. Most of them are in the scene where it's just the two of them. Uh, and then Rigsby comes in, and after Rigsby comes in, it's just Rigsby. It's all him. Yeah. Phil gets a line in about help the aged. But the, but basically, whenever Rigsby in is a scene, he just dominates it. Everyone else has to become the straight man to, to kind of set him up with sure. stuff. But that works. That somehow works. And the fact that you can take him out of a scene, and you've got Alan and Philip t- chatting, and it still works, and they can get laughs as well, I guess that must be good writing, I suppose. As we said before, it's a strong cast, isn't it? You know, it's good performances from everyone. Yes. So when Maureen comes in, her and Alan have this scene, and and it's more, mostly Maureen having getting the getting the gags. She is a very distinctly gag character. She's she's hitting punchlines, you know, in the same way that Rigsby does. Whereas you know, even Alan's laughs in that. Are, uh... But that that situation is Alan's trying to seduce this girl. He's trying to be quiet so Rigsby doesn't hear him. He puts the record on and she can't even hear it. Yeah. You know, so he is he's under tension. <laughs> you know, he's not relaxed, <laughs> and she's got all the control in that situation. So she can. He's yeah. the butt of the humor. Yeah. Everything he tries, she just knocks it back. Yeah. <laughs> knocks yeah, yeah. Back. <laughs> and, and then we get his earring again. <laughs> he says, "Oh, they're very fashionable." She goes, "Oh yeah, my our coal man's got one." <laughs> He's told her that he's a doctor, even though he's a first-term yes. medical student. <laughs> this is uh, another element of Alan's character, and something that obviously Richard Beckinsale brings to it. He's a very likeable character. Yeah. He's very sweet. And there's just a couple of moments when he kind of crosses a line. Uh, we talk, talk about when he's a bit homophobic yeah. uh, in that other episode, and that kind of just doesn't play well these days. But I think at the time, perhaps it wouldn't have mattered as much. Mm. But in this scene, he offers her a sweet, and she says, they're not sweets, they're tranquilizers. <laughs> My sister Adam turned a what? Green. And like he's trying to give this girl a tranquilizer. Like he's trying to he's trying to dose her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's like, like you don't get the sense it's full like Bill Cosby here. He's he's, he's trying to get her to relax because he's got things he's got. Much. It's kind of like you know, oh, have another bottle of wine. You know, let's open another bottle of wine. That kind of feel to it. But obviously, it has a little bit more of a creepy. It edge. Definitely, yeah. I think as I said before, I think taking a couple of pills to chill you out was a lot more socially acceptable in the seventies. However, yes, yeah, it's still very much giving her a roofie to calm her down. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it's definitely one of the moments where that character just steps over a line yeah. and it gets away with it because the character if you know the character you know he's so likeable you know he's kind of incompetent so you'd never get a sense that oh as soon as she, she's going to pass out and then he's going to feel her up it's like he's not going to do that and so it gets away with it but definitely just sort of seen on its own it, that's a clip that would definitely feel a bit yeah. off today but belying that we've got the rest of the scene he's just a sweet young boy trying to get with this girl and he can't even get a kiss off of her and she's obviously uh, not letting him get away with anything no she's uh, she's a lot more streetwise than he is Yes. Uh, and then Miss Jones crashes the party. Mm-hmm. She can smell burning. Obviously, we know Mr. Rigsby is uh, burning some wood somewhere. So that all gets broken up. Rigsby comes in and, and she's hidden. Maureen's hidden under the bed, and etc, etc. But before we get to that bit, we have the Rigsby and Miss Jones scene in which he attempts to seduce her with his wood. <laughs> <laughs> what on earth is that? It's a piece of wood. <laughs> Mr. Rigsby, stop wafting it around. You'll start a fire. I'll start a fire, all right, Miss Jones. Have you noticed anything yet? Yes, the most appalling smell. Uh, isn't ordinary wood, you know, it's special. Yeah. Breathe in. Go on, see what happens. I don't know what you've got in mind, Mr. Rigsby, but nothing's going to happen. Give way to me, Joe. Don't fight it. Give way to it. Give way to it. <laughs> of giving way to it. Please extinguish your stick. <laughs> 
which is a phenomenal bit of, again, and just a, an amazing bit of Leonard Rossiter yeah. here. I think it's just something that he brings so much after. Another little note here, he comes in like wafting his wood. There were at least four distinct separate laughs that came purely from wafting a piece of wood around. <laughs> Excellent work. And like, yeah, how do you do that? How do you get <laughs> just the keep getting the same laugh again and again? And of course it doesn't work. But he's so confident. Yeah, he's convinced this is going to work. Philip told him it's going to work. <laughs> Uh, but yes, it doesn't. And then we get him sprayed in the face with the spritzer. So there's a bit of a line of physical comedy that kind of goes with the farcical element, yeah. I guess. That is a pretty classic. The amount of times he gets water thrown in his face or a cake smashed into his face. It's it's a lot for a comedy that you don't think of as being mm. stupid. <laughs> well, I did that moment where she takes the spritzer bottle and sprays it on him. That took me out. That for me is that little bit too much physical comedy, that unrealism. Yeah. Incidentally, that's a very... 70s and 80s sitcom trope, those bottles. I've never seen one of those yes. bottles in the wild. <laughs> Where Did everyone have one of those bottles? Just in case they were sexually harassed. It's just, you can, so you can spray it on someone's crotch. Yeah. It's perfect. <laughs> There is something very 70s about that. It's like, it's having the, a kind of a bar, isn't there? Isn't it like, or, a, you know, Alan brings out his tray with bottles on it. He just blows bottles. the dust off them. <laughs> she said, do, what, do you want to have a drink? And she said, I'd rather drink out my canister, which uh, as a cyclist, I enjoyed. <laughs> Well, shall we, before we move away from this scene, we talked about Alan. Let's talk about yes. Richard Beckinsale now. So give me give me his background. Richard Beckinsale is sort of a classic, always wanted to be an actor, you know, from a very young age. Mm. Pursued that and was pretty good. He got into RADA. Oh, really? And went straight from there into rep. So, you know, he was just a young working actor. Very handsome. By all accounts, very likeable. Just a really laid-back, charming young man. Did his job well. Never caused anyone any trouble. Yeah. You know, that will give you a good career. In 1970, he got his first sort of lead sitcom role in The Lovers Mm -hmm. with Paula Wilcox, which is about these two young kids who were supposed to be about 20, 21 or something like that. They're just, you know, they're lovers. And it's young people dating and the problems that come with that. I watched a couple of episodes of it. Because I, I hadn't seen it before, yeah. so I thought I'll watch a couple for this. I really liked it. it it's, it's a nice little bit of work. It, it does feel a bit of its time, yeah. in the sense it's like 60s slash early 70s dating, and the expectations of she wants to get married, mm. he doesn't, you know, he just wants to get his end away. But there's a real kind of interesting language that they have between them, you know, the way they talk to each other. It, it is really nice. There's some genuine chemistry between them. I really like Paula, Paula Wilcox. Paula Wilcox is a great actress. I'm sure we'll cover her at some I, point. Yeah, I primarily know her from Man About the House, yeah. but I always liked her in that and she has really great chemistry with Richard O'Sullivan in that as well but that meant that when they came to do Rising Damp he was the one of the main cast who had sitcom experience so you'd said earlier about the cast in the play he was the one who hadn't been in the play right yes so Paul Jones was asked to do the show and he was like mm, yeah, the play didn't even do that well you know we never made any money out of it <laughs> yeah, sod it. Uh, so <laughs> he let that go and so they brought in Richard Beckinsale and, and like off the back of the lovers you know he, like he's always played this kind of slightly naive young man who's, you know, is trying to be part of the permissive society, but no one gives will give him any permission. So, yeah. and, and that's what he's playing in Rising Damp, really. Yeah. Rising Damp started at pretty much the exact same time as Porridge. Oh, really? Oh, that's interesting, because if Leonard Rossett is famous for Rising Damp and Reggie Perrin, then Richard Beckinsale is Rising Damp and Porridge. Very much two yes. huge roles, or, or famous roles. But I, yeah. I, I don't know, my, my misconception was Porridge came after Rising Damp. Clearly, I'm wrong about that. The whole Almost simultaneously. I think I think Porridge went out in the September and Rising Damp went out in November or, or you know, vice versa, something like that. They were very close in terms of starting in 74. In fact, you know, Rising Damp did one more series. But other than that, they were pretty much, you know, in step. Porridge had three series, I think. He got to a point where he was sick of playing the same character. Uh, you know, the kind of slightly naive young man, but he's very likeable. He was pushing 30 and he was still playing 21-year-old virgins in sitcoms and he wanted to do more series. Stuff. Yeah, I was just going to say that. If he's a rather trained actor, I'm sure he was he was frustrated that he wasn't playing the Dane or whatever. <laughs> yeah. And he's not a comedy actor. Like, he, in Por- both in Porridge and Rising Damp, you've got Ronnie Barker and Leonard Rossiter doing he's the, the straight heavy man, lifting. Isn't he? He's the, yeah, he's a straight man. I, I, I don't want to use that for any of them, really, because I don't think it's quite fair. It's not as simple as that. They He can be very funny. Yeah. So, yes, but... 
with uh, I don't want to quite kind of just slap that on him. But whereas you might look at Leonard Rosser and go, would I take him seriously if he was playing a lawyer or something? Yeah, I think with Richard Beckinsale you would. Of course, the real tragedy of Richard Beckinsale is that he died very suddenly. He died even at nineteen, uh, he, uh, much younger even than Rossiter, didn't he? Yes, he was thirty-one. Oh my goodness, I didn't realize it was that young when he died. Wow, nineteen seventy-eight, I think, maybe nineteen seventy-nine. Wow. Yeah, very young. He so was how did he die? A heart attack. God. Kind of undiagnosed heart problem that nobody really knew anything about. Obviously, that means that whenever people are talking about him now, they, they're they talking about someone who kind of went out in their peak. Mm. And it just seems like everyone loved him. In the same way that people talk about Leonard Rossiter as, as being difficult, but hey, it was worth it because he was so great. Yeah. With Richard Beckinsale, it's just like everybody loved him. You just wanted to be with him. You wanted to be around him because he was just so amazing. And that translates as well to like oh he was an amazing actor and while I've been going through this show I've been going up and down on like is he a good actor like have I seen anything really special about him like he's obviously good he is very good they all are actually in this show but I've seen I went out of my way to kind of find some of the bits and pieces of him acting and, and specifically some serious stuff and yeah. I've only ever seen him do that same kind of thing and then when he's being serious it just doesn't I don't know it just doesn't play he can't play a hard man and I think he's one of perhaps one of those people who could have aged out of it eventually and, and gone into a new phase of his career but he never had the opportunity yeah maybe he was definitely trying to do that so he's not in series 4 of Rising Down really ostensibly that was because he had theatre commitments he was doing a show on the West End uh, he was doing a musical I think he was you know he was trying to branch out and doing whatever he could but I think there's definitely an element of he was sick of these same roles mm. he was trying to get more serious roles trying to get more adult roles you know a bit more grown and was roles. he in that last series was he replaced was there a a, a, a new fourth member of the cast. No. So when Francis de la Tour missed a few episodes in series two, they brought in a new housemate, this woman. It was kind of there. But it wasn't quite a replacement, but there was another regular there. Yeah. But they didn't do that here. They just sort of brought in different people. They used the the characters they've got. And it worked. I mean, series four had the best viewing figures. We watched the Pink Carnation, the Lonely Hearts one that I mentioned. And... Mm. I'm afraid to admit, it hadn't occurred to me that Richard Beckinsale wasn't in it until you just pointed out. It's, no, of course he wasn't, was he? It's, it's surprising, isn't it? Like, it's surprisingly how little he's missed. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm genuinely, I'm, I'm a little bit annoyed at myself. I'm surprised. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't. I hadn't realised. Mm. Watched the whole episode and hadn't even missed him. And I've watched a few episodes as well where Philip is barely in it. Mm-hmm. I think the farcical episodes tend to favour him and Miss Jones because yeah. that works for that tone. Whereas Philip particularly doesn't get involved in far. Philip is so dignified. Mm-hmm. Like you can't do silly things with him. The closest they get is where they have, end up having a boxing fight and he throws the match. And that's kind of a bit physical and silly. But even in that, it's they're training to boxing and Philip is just a really good boxer and he's training and you can see he's going to smash his head in <laughs> uh, whereas Rigsby's training is stupid and silly yeah. and I think perhaps that's in a comedy perhaps that's a weakness of the Phil character that you can't be silly with him uh, with Alan similar but yeah it's definitely it favours Miss Jones and Rigsby for the fast stuff yeah. and I think like you were saying probably my least favourite stuff in the show <laughs> but yeah just to sort of Richard Beckinsale he, he, he got married very young that kind of all ended when he went to, to London and you know he was trying to get his acting career started and all mm-hmm. that but his daughter from that marriage is Samantha Beckinsale who's gone on to do some other uh, sitcom stuff she was in Get Well Soon which uh, I talked about in our Steptoe and Son that's uh, so Brick Compod that we're going straight to Samantha Beckinsale and not his other daughter. <laughs> well, yes, of course, his, his younger daughter, Kate Beckinsale, went to, went to that America and, and did big Hollywood Yeah, shows. but has she been in Game On? <laughs> I'm not interested. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. But um, uh, yes, so his first child, Samantha Beckinsale, because they split up and the mother got remarried and moved to Scotland and this other man adopted the child. And so okay. Richard Beckinsale was really encouraged to let that go. Just like, look, she's got a new dad now. She doesn't need you. And so he didn't see this kid for years. Blimey. And sort of the good thing, I suppose, is that he reconnected with her sort of the last sort of six months before he died. And so perhaps just reconnected with her a little bit. Yeah, uh, She would only have been 11 or 12 or something. That's interesting. And then, yeah, Kate Beckinsale was so his second marriage so that was the sort of the family 
he lived with and she was five years old when he died and all that. The fact they've both gone on to be actors is, is interesting, but perhaps he is still better known than them in British television, I suppose. Uh, well, yeah, okay, maybe in, in British sitcoms, but Kate Beckinsale's a huge <laughs> star. <laughs> I know, we, we, we're joking yeah. about it, but she's a Hollywood star. <laughs> Werewolves and that. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Back to our episode then. So what happens next? We've just got the kind of wrap up here, haven't we? He's, he's had a wash out with Miss Jones. The love stick, the love wood didn't work. Mm-hmm. We uh, have a little bit of more of a moment where Maureen comes out from under the bed. We get the, the fallout of all that. Yeah. Philip comes back in. We get a little tag on his whole story. How he, Because he helped Rigsby, he wants a favour, but then Rigsby's not going to let him have it. But then Philip gets the last laugh because he was burning the wardrobe. Yes. Which is pretty typical that Rigsby is still sort of the fool at the end. Yeah, he, he still Rigsby's furious and he wants to take it on someone, but he, he en- always ends up being the fool. Yeah. So that's the episode. Um, we haven't actually talked about Don Warrington uh, as no, an No, let's actor talk about Don. Let's talk details. about him. So yeah, Don Warrington. He was actually born in Trinidad. Then his family moved when he was five to Newcastle, as I'm sure you can tell by the accent. Oh, He's a Geordie. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know where that voice comes from. Like I don't know because he's got such a silky smooth voice and like you hear him talking he talks like that Mm, i've seen him in general that's his real voice but i suppose it's that acquired english voice that you know when when people are trying to assimilate themselves i suppose i don't know about that because even if like even if you talk about we talked about this with wilford bramble you know he had this very cut glass british accent Mm. uh when you hear him speak even though he's irish yeah yeah actors do tend to plumb it up a bit and part of the obviously the appeal of the philip character is that it doesn't seem right it it feels wrong it doesn't suit his look to have that voice yeah because it's, it's, people who look like him aren't sort of posh british people are they and that's the, not in the 70s that's what that's what affords him the status that undercuts rigsby yes and it's what makes that character quite groundbreaking you know in a mm. way not just to have a, a black character on tv but a, you know a way that you've never seen them before like, oh, black can, people can be posh as well <laughs> wow yeah but yeah, he's um, pretty classic, went to acting school, went into rep, you know, all that. But got the banana box job when he was very young. He was 23 when Rising Damp started. You know, he's young. And yeah. that was two years after the play. Uh, yeah, they, this was his breakthrough. He had a breakthrough before he was even starred, really. He's best remembered for this. Could you tell me anything else he's done? This is the thing. We, <laughs> Just we talked curiosity. about Rossiter and Beckinsale both had this and one other major sitcom role. Frances de la Tour is, is much much more of a recognised actress. Whereas Don Warrington, I, I, I've seen him in stuff. I sense that he's a jobbing actor, but he's never really... This will be the first line on his CV when, when they read out that he died on the news. I think he does more theatre than TV, mm. which perhaps it doesn't quite get into the awareness quite as well. But yeah, he's never he's never struggled for work from what I can tell. He does a, he has a little guest role in an episode of Red Dwarf that I always remember, very notable guest star in that. Yeah. Lots of voiceover stuff as you might imagine. He was on the dancing programme. Right. In 2008. Okay, well. So you got to be pretty uh, well known. I guess that's <laughs> well probably remembered. what most people would know him for then because that's very popular obviously. <laughs> Clearly, you and I have never seen that, but... Uh, <laughs> he is also a regular in that uh, Death in Paradise program that's been on for the last 15 years. So, he, yeah, he's one of those people who crop up in things. I think he does his best work in theatre. Mm. I think that's the general idea, but... What an amazing voice. <laughs> <laughs> it's just such a silky smooth voice. It's great. And I really like him in the show. The fact that he's so unflappable and he's always the winner he's always just so effortlessly cool (laughs) well I think that I love the character I don't disagree with any of that but my question is we're talking about Don Warrington here not Philip Mm -hmm. is Don Warrington a good actor is it a great (laughs) performance or is it a great character I'm not I'm not sure I love the character it's quite a low energy performance isn't it which is what's needed so yeah maybe that maybe that is good acting not all good acting has to be flashy does it yeah it's hard to tell because I haven't seen him in enough to really Mm. judge him I haven't seen him do anything significantly different to kind of go oh he was in that very well you know he had to get angry and shout at someone and let me ask you about the character then do we know what his background is well because obviously he spins this line to to Rigsby about he's the son of an African chief and uh, you know the episodes that I've seen we never really get told explicitly whether that's true or not but now have I just missed the relevant episodes no I mean what what's your read on it what do you think because why why are you even questioning it? Like what what makes you think it might not be true? Because why is he in that slum? <laughs> 
Because <laughs> he's black. Why? Where else is he going to go? People won't have him. Yeah, yeah, possibly. But with that accent, you then, you know, presumably he's come from his native country and he's gone to uh, an English boarding school and to Oxford and Cambridge and he's acquired that accent and that refinement. And now he's living in a slum. That doesn't kind of add up. Well, it's, it's an interesting question that you ask uh, because in the original play, the inspiration for it was someone who was pretending to be a sort of African prince. And in the play, it is revealed that he is actually from Clapham. Right. uh, And it's all put on, basically. In the TV show, that is never brought out. They did a film in 1980, Mm. which was mostly cannibalised bits of other episodes that they kind of strung together. Richard Beckinsale was dead at that point, so they brought in another actor. To do the same character? It's a different character, but it fulfills the exact same role. Uh, Christopher Strolley, who's in Only When I Laugh, so it was kind of someone Eric Chappell brought in, I suppose. He went to RADA with uh, Beckinsale, so they kind of knew each other, I guess that helped. The film doesn't work that well. It is just kind of pieced together material from the other episodes, so the structure doesn't feel that great. And as with so many of these based on sitcom films, it's it's missing the laugh track. It, it's it's like yeah. sentences without punctuation. It, it just doesn't have the same flow, and the, the actors aren't riding the waves in the same way, and it just never quite works. The important thing about that is, in the film, we have this reveal that, um, Philip doesn't know anything about Africa. <laughs> um, Rigsby finds this out. Basically, what he he does is like you could be the son of a chief. What do we know? You know, who knows how far back you, you, your heritage goes? Like he, Rigsby prefers to keep up the pretense, okay, because it suits them both. Because that's uh, yeah, because he doesn't want to be bested by someone he sees as inferior. Yeah, but also the fact that he has someone of class yeah. under his roof is, yeah. is 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 good for him. Yeah, and it's a nice moment in in the show. I'm not sure how it play, goes out in the play, but in the film, it's a nice moment that is kind of like, do you know what? We're all just happier with this artifice as it stands. So. So let's yeah. stick with it. But yeah, I think it's very interesting that they never do that in the show. I think there was all a, a plan to do it at some point and then it just never happened. Mm. And I just think that's a big error. I, I really would think that's... I think it should have been revealed like at the end of the first episode. That should be your setup, but not to Rigsby. Yeah. Alan finds yeah. out. So Phil and Alan know. And maybe Miss Jones doesn't know, or maybe she does, but Rigsby doesn't know. So we're all in on the joke that Rigsby doesn't know. And it would still you could still have the episodes all exactly as they are, but as an audience we know that Phil is getting the upper hand. Mm. Because otherwise you do have these odd bits where he's just sort of like trotting out these weird like African ritual things that just sound like nonsense. Uh, yes. and, and you do get a sense that he's being sarcastic sometimes, but we're supposed to take it on face value. When he talks about the love wood and he's winding up Rigsby, yeah. like, th- there's no way that one could believe that's true. Yeah, You could believe that this African prince is making it up to wind Rigsby up, or it could be this bloke from yes. Clapham is making it up to wind Rigsby up, but you don't believe that that's a true story. So so either mm. way, it's still, you know, we're still making fun of Rigsby here. Yeah, and when Alan believes something, that's the believable stuff, I guess. Yeah. So, like, when he, you know, Alan believes that he has ten wives and, and, and all that sort of stuff. So I think that's a really interesting element of this show, the fact that that was a choice not to reveal that. Personally, I think I would prefer it knowing that. Yeah. And I guess I do, because I know it, so I watched <laughs> it with that, with that in mind. But that is why I sort of didn't tell you that. <laughs> um because I wanted to see what you made of that. Uh, and so it's interesting you brought that up. Yeah, I uh, well, I was kind of a little nervous about bringing it up because I didn't want to make myself sound too stupid. <laughs> but yeah, it just didn't ring true to me. That's good writing then, I suppose, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, ambiguity. Yeah. I suppose the only other character we haven't really talked about is Vienna the cat. <laughs> yes. Now, there is a... Bit a, of a troublesome beast, apparently. I can't remember which episode. It might have been the first episode where, you know, why is he called Vienna? Well, because when you open that door, oh, it's good night, Vienna. And I thought... <laughs> yeah. Are we, have we really named that cat just so we can do that gag? Because <laughs> it's not a strong enough gag. <laughs> it seems so. <laughs> do you know what that feels like? It's something a hangover from the play. Because in a play, it's just a little one-line throwaway thing, gag. And you then know. you end up with 28 episodes of uh, a badly named cat. With this cat. cat. <laughs> That's as complicated as it gets. <laughs> 
But yeah, I like the cat. Apparently it was a bit of a troublesome thing, you know, he never wanted to do what he wanted it to do. It always seems so docile, though. Yeah. Rossiter, like, grasps it <laughs> firmly within his grip. He never lets go of it when he needs it. But it always just seems very placid. It doesn't seem like it's trying to get away. The episode Clunk Click, which is where Rigsby has a car. Yes. The farcical element is that he thinks he's run over Vienna, and actually it's just Miss Jones's fur stole, which they end up burning. Yes. What's striking is how upset he is to have lost Vienna. Vienna seems to be the only thing in his life that he really loves. It's, it's very sad. Yes. It's very sad that he's, he's so upset. I like that episode because it's Phil who tells him the cat's dead, basically, and puts in this bag. And you can tell, like, when it comes back, Phil comes back later and it's like, what, you still think the cat's dead? Kind yeah. of like, doesn't quite yeah, say that. Joke. But it's like, he's always like, oh God, it was just a throwaway joke and now it's gone too far. And what I really like about that is when he knows that it's going to be revealed, well, well, you know, Alan brings the cat in and he just grabs Alan and runs off. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, we need to get out of yeah. here before yeah, this yeah. gets I don't off. want to be around. <laughs> So I quite like that. There's no because it just feels like it's not built into the plot. It's just like oh god, uh, run away. <laughs> so anyway, look, that's that's our episode. Is there anything else that you want to say about the legacy of Rising Damp? That's it, really. I mean, <laughs> there isn't much of a legacy because they there's been there was a Portuguese remake that apparently did quite well. They made a pilot for an American show, but nothing came of it. And I heard an interview with Eric Chappell in which he said, you know, quite a few people have tried to come to me to remake it, and I've refused permission. I guess they've tried to Is do Eric Chappell still alive? Yes. Yeah. He's late 80s now. Yeah, but um, still still going. I guess he's not still still writing. I don't think so. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if he's still knocking out plays here and there. I've, I've, I've heard interviews him, with him fairly recently. He seems very compass mentis. He, you know, no reason why he shouldn't be. He's a typewriter. Right, that's that's Rising Damp. I, I want to say, though, I have to say, I think Rising Damp is up there for me as one of my favourite sitcoms. Wow. And like that's saying something. I watch a lot of sitcoms. Because <laughs> yeah. I, I would say this and Porridge are, are kind of up, really up there. And having re-watched Rising Damp now, mm. I'm sort of still happy with that having gone through it all again and gone through it with a fine tooth comb for all this I think it'd be easy to break it apart mm. but I and I think I, really what good sitcom for me comes down to is good writing and good acting yeah with Leonard Rossiter it, it absolutely nails it the range of gags that they have and do you know what I like about Eric Chappell's writing is that it, it doesn't feel too gaggy like it, it's mm. It doesn't feel like you're building up to a punchline. It feels like character comedy. Yes. Obviously, there are punchlines as the farcical elements, but I think they work as well. So, yeah, not to put too fine a point on it, this would be in my top five, I think. That's great. I, 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 agree, with, I agree with you that I love the writing. And, you know, I've sort of quoted a few lines here. And it's not that they're joke jokes. It, it's got an, an almost yeah, exactly, Alan yeah. Bennett element to it at times with the way that, <laughs> yes. with the, way that the dialogue is. I'm going to give you one last quote, which I really love. Uh, Alan says, you know what you need? Charisma. I'm not spraying myself with that stuff, mate. Thank you for listening. Hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, then do us a favour. Go and rate and review us on iTunes. We're a new show, and that sort of thing really helps to uh, raise your profile, get, gets you found in the search algorithms and all that sort of thing. So do that. That's a way to help us out. And, uh, you know, recommend us to a friend if you think you know someone who would be interested. Do go back and check out our other episodes if you haven't already, and keep an eye out for future episodes. Next week we'll be looking at something a little bit less of a classic, Dear John. Do check us out on the social medias. We are at BritcomPod. That's on uh, Instagram and Twitter. We have the Facebook group British Sitcom History. Go and search for us, find us out, talk to us. We're really enjoying all the feedback we're getting. So do come and get involved in the conversation. Thank you for listening. See you next time.